Hello and welcome everyone. My name is John M. Hawkins. The show is called My Strategy and we're coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We're very happy to be here with you today on this Saturday. My Strategy episodes are live at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, today we're going to be talking about questions and what are some good questions that you can ask. It ultimately can be a good way for you to get the answers that you seek. Well, again, uh, very happy to be here with you today. Uh, for me, Saturday is the day of the week that I choose to reflect on my strategy and personal development plan. Uh, but keep in mind that any time is a good time to assess your strategy. Now, the My Strategy radio show continues to grow. We're available on iHeart, iTunes, Player FM, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spreaker, and many more digital platforms. So you can go there to listen to this episode in a podcast format or listen to any of the other episodes. You can find me on most social media platforms. My Twitter handle is at HawkinsJohn, and my website is JohnMHawkins.com. Again, Twitter handle is at HawkinsJohn, and website is JohnMHawkins.com. And just like anything in life, we need to have a strategy and a plan to help us reach our goals because the best laid plans don't always work. Now this week I am looking for your stories on questioning, do you have any good examples or perhaps a tip or a trick that you use? You can send it to talk at johnmhawkins.com. All right, so in this episode, we're talking about the benefits of asking good questions and questions in general. Bad things can happen when you don't ask the right questions. There's some essential questions that you should know. Asking good questions can increase your emotional intelligence. Leading questions can lead to faulty conclusions, and we're going to discuss ways to help you build your questioning strategy. And I think this is one of those topics that uh, has really got me intrigued over the past few months. Uh, as I'm in conversations with many people, I hear some questions and I started thinking, wow, that is a really good question. And what could I do to help increase my awareness of good questions to ask and ultimately uh, use it on a daily basis? So that's kind of the reason behind this show. And uh, my goal is to really come up with a, a framework or a plan that I can use to help be someone who is better at asking questions. So that's what the show is all about. We're going to start off today uh, talking about terrible things that can happen to you when you don't ask the right questions. I don't know if they're terrible, but they could be bad things or perhaps opportunities that are missed. I've got an article here by Benjamin Hardy, and this uh, article appeared on Inc.com. It says, if you're not asking good questions regularly, these three terrible things are happening to you. It says, even more, people are so good at talking that they're bad at listening. And people are really bad at asking questions, according to Benjamin Hardy. Firstly, they don't ask enough questions. Secondly, they haven't learned the art of asking powerful questions, the ones that lead to epiphany, breakthrough, and redirection. According to Dave Will, the founder of Prop Fuel, which is an employee and customer feedback platform, people often pretend to know what they're talking about. They want to look smart, be confident. He says this is actually one of the worst things they could do. Research has found that people who don't ask questions in an attempt of looking smart actually are viewed as less intelligent to other people. Put more directly, when you ask thoughtful and genuinely interested questions, people don't think you're dumb. Rather, they think you're really smart. I'm going to pause a little bit on this and think about it. You know, many times you're in conversations and you uh, people will ask, are there any questions? There might be a little bit of a pause. Or there are certain folks in the group who come up with questions right off the top of their head. And you're like, well, why didn't I think of that question? Well, I think they might actually be strategically using questioning to their advantage. And that's what we want to do today is understand what are some of the different types of questions we can be asking. And when should we be asking these questions? 
And if we can come up with a strategy, then you too can be the smart person in the room with the best questions. So they think you're smart for a few reasons. People who ask questions are generally more humble. When you ask people questions, you demonstrate that you respect them. When people feel respected and heard, they, like you, feel more connected. The connection between the two of you becomes better. You'll be able to engage in more meaningful dialogue, be able to gain clarity rather than pretending to have clarity and having a pseudo-relationship. If you don't ask questions, you're not curious. And according to Will, the most engaged companies and employees promote lots of questions. In fact, questions are a lot better to have than the answers. I guess, do you think that's true? Is it better to have the right questions than to have the right answers? We're exploring that today. It says here that questions show that leaders, that an employee is truly curious about what they are doing. Will also recommends that by the end of the day, all employees and leaders should ask themselves, what did I learn today? I used to ask my kids every day when I would pick them up from school when they were younger, what did you learn today? And sometimes I got blank stares. Other times I got, you know, a little statement saying maybe I didn't learn anything. So I would say, well, you spent all day sitting there in school and you haven't learned anything. Well, they got into the habit of at least coming up with one thing that they learned on a daily basis. But how many of us ask ourselves every day after work, what did we learn today? The hypothesis here is that if we didn't learn, perhaps it's because we weren't asking any questions, plain and simple. It says there's big consequences to not asking questions. According to Will, there are these three huge consequences. Number one, you're relying on past experiences, which according to Paul Arden is arrogant. You're likely stagnating and not growing. You're probably not going the right direction because like airplanes, going in the right direction requires constant course corrections. His conclusion is when you start asking targeted questions, you'll get much closer to the vivid vision. You'll get clarity. People who only talk about themselves aren't respected long term. Many people feel valuable and ask themselves questions. Not only will you learn a lot more, but again, you'll develop a much, much deeper and more authentic relationships. Finally, Will explains that the more risky the question, the more valuable, the greater opportunity for a return. For example, if you're doing a podcast and ask generic questions, you'll get generic answers. If you ask risky questions, it might come back to haunt you. But if you do it in the right way, you'll get more rich and beautiful information and dialogue as insight. Some questions that they gave us to consider are, are you getting clarity? Are you going in the right directions? Are your relationships deep and authentic? Are you getting rich and beautiful dialogue and insight or all of your conversations about you? You're listening to My Strategy. I'm your host, John M. Hawkins, coming to you live from the BBM Global Network. When we come back, we're going to talk about some essential questioning techniques that you must know. We'll be right back. Hello and welcome back, everyone. I'm John M. Hawkins. The show is called My Strategy, and we're coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We're very happy to be here with you today. Glad you could join us. Today we're talking about asking the right questions. Right before the break, we talked about terrible things that can happen to you when you don't ask the right questions. Maybe they're terrible, maybe they're bad, but definitely you are not going to be getting as many opportunities if you don't ask the right questions. In this segment, I want to talk a little bit about some of the essential questioning techniques that you must know. So get out your pen and paper or your notebook digital format and write these down because these are the framework, part of the framework that we need to start using and developing to be able to ask good questions. We've got an article here by Georgina Guthrie, and she talks about eight essential questioning techniques. 
And many of these you might know, maybe one or two. Uh, you might uh, recall three or four, uh, but all, I'm, I doubt anyone knows all eight. And if you do know all eight before we start this segment, I would love to talk with you because I could learn a lot about questioning and, and how it all works. Georgina starts off by saying, um, Getting an, answer, getting an understanding of the specific types of questions you ask not only helps you achieve better, understand, better answers and build stronger relationships, but it'll also help you avoid misleading people and prevent you from suffering from a dreaded communication breakdown. She starts off with the everyday types of questions people ask and the answers they are l likely to elicit. The first type of question is a closed question. Closed question, also known as the polar question, generally invites a one-word answer, such as yes or no. For example, do you drive? Did you take my pen? They could include answers to factual or multiple choice questions, such as what is your name? Would you like tea or coffee or water? She says these are very popular icebreaker questions, and they are good for warming up group discussions, getting a quick answer. So that is the closed questions, closed questions. A second is open questions. Open-ended questions require a little more thought and generally encourage wider discussion and elaboration. They can't be answered with a simple yes or no. For example, what did you think of your boss? Or why did you choose that car? She says this is useful for critical or creative discussions, finding out more information about a person or a subject. And you can see how open questions can also get lots and lots of detail. But if you have a specific objective, it could take you away from that objective. So it's a tactic or a technique that we can use. The next one is probing questions. These questions are useful for gaining clarification and encouraging others to tell you more information about a specific question. Probing questions are usually a series of questions that dig deeper and provide a fuller picture. For example, when do you need to finish the project? And is it okay if I email it to you by? These are useful for seeing the bigger picture, encouraging a reluctant speaker to tell you more information and avoid, avoiding miscommunications and understandings. Next type of questions are leading questions. These questions are designed to lead the respondent toward a certain desired either positive or negative route. In the workplace, you might encounter leading questions such as, do you have any issues with the project? Or did you enjoy working on that project? The former subtly prompts the respondent towards a negative response, the latter towards a positive. Asking how did you get on with that project will get you a more balanced answer. Now, think about this, you know, as you do ask questions in the daily, in your day-to-day, -day, what types of questions are you asking? These types of questions are useful for building positive discussion closing a sale, steering a conversation towards an outcome. But a word of warning, it's important to use leading questions carefully. They can be seen as unfair of getting the answers you, you know, of an unfair way of getting the answers you want. Loaded questions. Loaded questions are seemingly straightforward, state, closed questions, but they have a twist. They contain an assumption about the respondent. They're famously used by lawyers and journalists to trick their interviewee into admitting a fundamental truth that they would otherwise be unwilling to disclose. For example, have you stopped stealing pens? Assumes the respondent stole a pen and more than once. When they answer yes or no, they will admit they have stolen pens at some point. So this is useful for discovering facts about someone who would otherwise be reluctant to offer up information, which you can see in the workplace that might not be the most appropriate, or it may be appropriate at certain times. Funnel questions. As with funnel, these types of questions begin broadly before narrowing up to a specific point. When meeting someone new, we usually begin with specific closed questions, such as, what's your name? What do you do? Before broadening out into more open-ended questions, such as, why did you choose to be a firefighter? As you become more comfortable talking to each other, the reverse. Beginning with a broader questions becomes honing in on something specific. It's often used when questioning witnesses to gain maximum amount of information. 
funnel questions can be used to diffuse tension, asking someone to go into more details about their issues or distract them from anger, and they'll give you the information that you need. Use these funnel questions for building relationships, discovering very specific information. Recall and process questions. Recall questions require the recipient to remember a fact. For example, what's 7 times 7? And where did you put the keys? What's your login password? Process questions, on the other hand, require the respondent to add their own opinion to the answer. Process questions, uh, these types of questions can be used to test the respondent's depth of knowledge about a particular topic. For example, what is the advantages of asking a closed question? Or why are you the right person to lead this project? These are useful for encouraging critical thought and in-depth evaluation of a subject in tests, interviews, or discussions. This is one I'm sure many of you know. It is a rhetorical question. These are different beasts altogether. They don't require an actual answer. They're simply a statement phrased as a question to make the conversation more engaging to the listener who is drawn into agreeing with you. For example, isn't it nice working with such a friendly team? That is more engaging than this team is friendly, which doesn't require any mental participation from the respondent. Rhetorical questions are often used by coaches or public speakers for effect to get the audience thinking and agreeing. In this way, they're, not, they're a not-too-distant cousin of the leading question. Useful for persuading people, building engagement. A word on tone says tone, context, intonation, and body language will all help us make some sense of what is being asked or what happens when you throw technology into the mix in a place of digital screen. It adds complexity. Now, emojis and GIFs have worked their way into the workplace, and they're here to stay. Moreover, there's no denying that they enhance interpersonal communications and go some way towards fulfilling our need to have something a little more human. With a certain level of carefulness, tone, and knowledge and how to ask questions in the right way, you can get a lot more out of your work relationships. That was an article on Inc. Magazine all about communication and what are some of the things that we can do um, with regard to asking questions. And you know, I think that as I think about this topic today and the questions that I ask, I think there's a lot more work for me to do to help hone my, my questioning ability. And I'm hoping that as I hone that ability, it does help me with my, uh, my strategy. You're listening to My Strategy Radio Show. I'm your host, John M. Hawkins, coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. When we come back, we're going to talk about the power of questioning and how it can help increase our emotional intelligence. We'll be right back. Hello and welcome back, everyone. I'm John M. Hawkins. The show is called My Strategy Coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Well, welcome back, everyone. Today we're talking about questions and how questions can help us get the right answer. Right before the break, we were talking about eight different types of questioning techniques that everyone should know. In this segment, I'd like to talk a little bit about the power of questioning and how by asking questions, it can actually help increase our emotional intelligence, which we've talked about in the past. So if you're interested in that podcast, you can Google um, John M. Hawkins and emotional intelligence, and you should be able to find it. All right, so the power of questioning. I've got an article here by Allison Wood Brooks and Leslie K. John talks about the surprising power of questions. They start off by saying much of an executive's day is spent asking others for information, requesting status updates from the team leaders, for example, or questioning a counterpart in a tense negotiation. 
Yet unlike professionals such as litigators, journalists, and doctors who are taught how to ask questions, an essential part of their training, few executives think of questioning as a skill that can be honed or consider how their own answers to questions could make conversations more productive. I think that's what we're trying to do here, right? I mean, we're not, or maybe you are, maybe your job requires that you learn how to ask questions. But for those of us whose jobs don't require that, we can be effective with the questions that we have. But if we can come up with a framework and come up with some tactics and apply those to our own personal development and use that in our personal life and our work life, I, I feel that there's an opportunity for us to be much more impactful. And that's, that's what this show is all about. The, the author goes on to say that's a missed opportunity. Questioning is a unique, powerful tool for unlocking value in organizations. It spurs learning in the exchange of ideas. It fuels innovations and performance improvement. It builds rapport and trust among team members and can mitigate business risk by uncovering unforeseen pitfalls and hazards. For some, questioning comes very easily. Their natural inquisitiveness, emotional intelligence, and ability to read people put the ideal question on the tip of their tongue. But most of us don't ask enough questions, nor do we pose our inquiries in an optimal way. The good news is that by asking questions, we naturally improve our emotional intelligence, which in turn makes us better questioners. It's a virtuous cycle, according to the author. And in this article, they draw on insights from behavioral science research to explore how they frame these questions and choose to answer our counterparts can influence the outcome of the conversation. We offer guidance for choosing the best type, tone, sequence, and framing of questions for deciding what and how much information to share to reap the most benefit from our interactions, not just from ourselves, but from our organizations. Don't ask, don't get. Be a good listener, according to Dale Carnegie, as, as Carnegie, as he advised in his 1936 classic, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Ask questions the other person will enjoy answering. More than 80 years later, most people still fail to heed Carnegie's sage advice. When one of us began studying conversations at Harvard Business School, this was Allison, several years ago, she quickly arrived at a foundational insight. People don't ask enough questions. In fact, among the most common complaints people have a people make after having a conversation, such as an interview, a first date, or work meeting, they say they wish they'd asked me more questions. And I can't believe they didn't ask me any questions. So the question is, uh, why are we being held back? They said there's many reasons why people are held back. Perhaps they're egocentric, eager to impress others with their own thoughts and stories and ideas, and they don't even think to ask questions. Perhaps they're apathetic. They don't care to ask. They anticipate being bored by the answer they'd hear. They might be overconfident in their own knowledge or think they know the answers, which sometimes they do, but they usually don't. Or perhaps they worry that the wrong question will be and, and it will be viewed as rude or incompetent. But the biggest inhibitor, in our opinion, is that most people don't understand how beneficial good questioning techniques can be. And if they did, they would end up they would end far fewer sentences with a period and more with a question mark. They go on to talk about how questioning that dates back to the 1970 research suggests that people have conversations to accomplish some combination of two major goals. Information exchange, such as learning, and impression management, liking. Research shows that Asking questions achieves both. All those in the study, and there's multiple names here, scrutinized thousands of natural conversations among participants who were getting to know each other, either in online chats or in person speed dates. The researchers told some people to ask many questions, at least nine in 15 minutes. Others were asked 
only a few questions, less than four and 15 minutes, and then the balance of the other. They found that those who had a balance of questions actually were more productive in conversation than those who asked too many questions or not enough. You're listening to My Strategy. I'm your host, John M. Hawkins, coming to you live from the VVM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. When we come back, we're going to continue talking about the power of questioning. We'll be right back. Hello and welcome back, everyone. I'm John M. Hawkins. The show is My Strategy. And if you're just joining us, welcome. Today we're talking about questions and asking the right questions. Uh, right before the break, we were talking about the power of questioning. We have an article here that we were referring to. And I wanted to continue on this topic. And right before the break, uh, you know, they were talking about a research study that goes back to the 1970s and also additional studies since then that show that asking no questions or too many questions, as you can imagine, uh, can be counterproductive. But if you have the right balance of questions, that is when you have your optimal amount of impact. And it also says here that asking a lot of questions unlocks learning, but it also improves interpersonal bonding. And I think that's true. And that's what we're trying to do today. The show, My Strategy Show, is all about developing your personal strategy. We spend Saturdays doing that. And this week, we're trying to unlock the power of questioning and hopefully be able to use it to our own advantages. We're going to use it all for good, though. No evil. No evil this time. All for good. The article continues, questions are such powerful tools that they can be beneficial, perhaps particularly so in circumstances when question asking goes against social norms. For instance, prevailing norms tell us that job candidates are expected to answer questions during interviews. But researcher Dean Cable at the London School of Business and Virginia Kay at the University of North Carolina suggest that most people excessively self-promote during job interviews. And when interviewees focus on selling themselves, they're less likely to ask questions about the interviewer, the organization, the work. And if they had asked that, that would make the interviewer feel more engaged and more apt to view the candidate favorably and could help the candidate predict whether the job would provide satisfying work. For job candidates, asking such, such questions such as, what am I not asking that you think I should, can signal competence, build rapport, and unlock key pieces of information about the position. Are you asking questions when you're in interviews? Have you been in an interview recently? Did you just get asked questions and then say, I have no questions? According to the research, it suggests that you should have some questions. And if you don't have them at the time of the interview, come prepared to the interview with some questions. It could be about the company. It could be about the role. But come prepared. Um, it really is important uh, to ask questions. That is really going to help build the interpersonal, the interpersonal connection with somebody. The article goes on to talk about the new Socratic method. The first step in becoming a better questioner is simply to ask more questions. Of course, the sheer number of questions is not the only factor that influences the quality of the conversation. The type, tone, sequence, and framing also matters. They go on to talk about their teaching in the Harvard Business School, where they run exercises in which they instruct pairs of students to have a conversation. Some students are told to ask as few questions as possible, and some are instructed to ask as many questions as possible. Among the low, low pairs, both students that ask the minimum number of questions and participants generally report that experience is a bit like children engaging in parallel play. They exchange statements but struggle to initiate interactive, enjoyable, or productive dialogue. The high pair finds that too many questions also create a distilled dynamic. 
However, the high-low pairs experiences are mixed. Sometimes a questioner asker learns a lot about their partner. The answerer feels heard, and both come away feeling profoundly closer. Other times, one of the participants may feel uncomfortable in their role and unsure about how to share, and the conversation can feel more like an interrogation. Research suggests that several approaches can enhance the power and efficacy of queries. The best approach for a given situation depends on the goals of the conversationalist. Specifically, whether the discussion is cooperative, for example, the duo is trying to build a relationship or accomplish a task together, or competitive, the party seeks to uncover sensitive information. It says the conversation goals matter. Do you go into a conversation with a goal, or is it more just trying to kill time? Good question. Uh, conversations fall along a continuum from purely competitive to purely cooperative. For example, discussions about the allocation of scarce resources tend to be competitive. Those between friends and colleagues are generally more cooperative. And others, such managers, check-ins, and employees are mixed, supportive, but also providing feedback and communicating expectations. Here are some common challenges that arise when asking, when asking and answering questions and tactics for handling them. So the article goes on and talks about many of the questions that we've already, uh, types of questions that we discussed in, in an earlier segment. We, it's worthwhile repeating. It says, first of all, not all questions are created equally. The research shows that using human coding and machine learning revealed four types of questions. Introductory questions, like, how are you? Mere questions, I'm fine, how are you? Full switch questions, ones that change the topic entirely. And follow-up questions, ones that solicit more information. Although each type is abundant in natural conversation, Follow-up questions seem to have a special power. They signal to your conversation partner that you are listening, care, and want to know more. People interacting with a partner who asks lots of follow-up questions tend to feel respected and heard. Note to self, focus on the follow-up questions. An unexpected benefit of follow-up questions is that they don't require much thought or preparation. Indeed, they seem to come naturally to interluders. In Allison's study, the people who were told to ask more questions used more follow-up questions than any other type of others without being instructed to do so. So know when to keep these questions open-ended. No one wants to feel interrogated, and some types of questions can force answerers into a yes-no corner. We talked more about that. They also go on to talk about some of the closed questions. Um, how open questions um, aren't always optimal either, especially if you're in a tense negotiation or dealing with someone who tends to keep their cards close to their chest. We go on to talk about some other studies, and there's some um, additional information that was done about direct questions and when they work and when they don't work. Article goes on to talk about getting the sequence right. I think this is extremely important because we've talked about all these different types of questions. But when is the right time to ask the question? And I think, and what type of question should we be asking? So as we're starting to think about our strategies, that might be a good area for us to focus on. You're listening to My Strategy. I'm your host, John M. Hawkins, coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. When we come back, we're going to talk about leading questions and why they're not good. We'll be right back. Hello and welcome back, everyone. I'm John M. Hawkins. The show is my strategy, and we're coming to you live from the BBM Global Network in TuneIn Radio. We're well, very happy to be here with you today. Today we're talking about questions. Uh, right before the break, we were talking about the power of questioning questions and how we can use them. In this segment, I want to talk a little bit about leading questions. And I said they're bad, but I don't know if they're bad, but they do direct a witness to a particular conclusion. Also, in this segment, we do talk about our strategy, and hopefully you've been picking up enough tips throughout the show to put together your strategy. 
But ultimately, we need to become aware of our vision and our goals. We want to assess and analyze, you know, figure out what are some steps we can take. So are you good at questioning? Could, could it improve you or your uh, communication or not? We then implement our plan and get support and evaluation. So five steps. We're not going to cover too much of that today because I thought it'd be important for us to talk a little bit about leading questions. Got an article here that talks about uh, examples of leading questions. It says anyone who's ever watched a crime TV or a police proce procedural drama is familiar with the concept of a leading question. But when compared with the dramatization, the reality is much more complicated. At its most basic level, a leading question is one that directs a witness towards a particular conclusion by way of being overly suggestive. Not only do different authorities often disagree on whether or not a given question qualifies as leading, but there are actually situations in court in which leading questions is permitted and even appropriate. This includes when a witness is hostile or when a witness is being cross-examined but there are several constraints on how leading questions may be phrased in either case. So let me go through the five ones, and I thought this was interesting. So suggestive insinuation. Did you see Michael at 3 p.m.? That's the question. This would qualify under most circumstances as a leading question. It plants the suggestion of the corresponding time and place in the subject's minds. Eyewitness testimony is often unreliable, and it is prone to unclear recollections, false memories, and personal subjectivity. Simply mentioning a quantity or value that differs from the actual actuality of what occurred can cause a witness to provide false information, often without realizing it. In a criminal trial, the difference between 2.45 and 3 p.m. might be profound, but people wouldn't consider it to be too much of too much importance. The correct phrasing for this question would be more along the lines of, at what time did you see Michael on the day in question? At what time did you see Michael on the day in question versus did you see Michael at 3 p.m.? The next, the next here is too many variables. Have you ever asked a question with too many variables in it? The example they provide is, did Janice strike you in the face with her fist? would qualify as a leading question, but also it's got too many variables in it. And it's going to be hard to get a simple, reliable answer. This is a relatively simple question, but the same issue can arise in circumstances that are too complicated, wherein each variable needs to be addressed separately. The correct course of action, given the example, would be to ask the witness, did Janice do anything to you? Followed by a separate question. Where did Janice strike you? Now, I know this is, is subtle. It's, it's a nuance of asking the question. But how many times in your day today do you find yourself asking questions? You're asking too many. You're not asking enough. And what type of questions are you asking? Are you using questions that have too many variables in them, like this example? Too many variables in this case would be, did Janice strike you in the face with her fist? So it's a leading question, but also too many variables. So they suggest breaking it out into, did Janice do anything to you? Pause, wait for a response. Where did Janice strike you? So that's where, if you're not professionally trained in asking questions, that's where this can, can come in handy in our personal development, is, is trying to be better at that. And we're not trying to be interrogators. We're just trying to effectively communicate. The next one here is glossing over important details. This one says, Mr. Reinfeld owned this revolver, correct? Followed by, and this is the same revolver that was found at the murder scene, correct? In this example of how clev a clever attorney might try to bias the jury against the defendant across a series of two or more questions, which may or may not provide, which are, may or may not be individually leading, but which combine to produce the same effect. In the example provided, both of these facts might be true, but the witness is legally constrained by providing any additional information that is beyond which is directly relevant to the question being asked. It is easy to see how 
the jury might be unfairly biased by the information presented in the example. Despite the fact that Mr. Reinhold reported his revolver was stolen weeks ago before the murder was committed, if the prosecuting attorney doesn't ask about the theft, the witness has no legal way to inform the jury of his status at the time the murder was committed. Asserting unconformed qualities is another one. There's also jury manipulation through reverse psychology. I thought these were interesting examples here because, as you can see, they are related to what you might see in a court of law. But also, if we use these techniques, it can help us be more effective in our communications. You're listening to My Strategy. I'm your host, John M. Hawkins, coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to help you put your plan in place. I'll be right back. Hello and welcome back. I'm John M. Hawkins. The show is My Strategy, and we're coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Well, in case you missed this broadcast, and I hope you didn't, but if you did, you can listen on iHeartRadio and Apple iTunes. And if you'd like to have something covered in this show, send an email to talk at johnmhawkins.com. That's talk at johnmhawkins.com. Or you can pick up a telephone and call us at 1-844-MY-STRATEGY. That's 844-MY-STRATEGY. Well, in this episode, we've been talking about benefits of good questions, bad things that can happen to you when you don't ask the right questions. We talked about some essential questions you should know, how asking good questions can increase your emotional intelligence, how leading questions can lead to faulty conclusions, but can also be incredibly important in the court of law and perhaps at work, ways to build your strategy. But can terrible things happen to you when you don't ask the right questions? It's a possibility that maybe not terrible, but it could be that we're missing out on many opportunities. Why don't we ask questions? We don't ask them because we might want to look smart and confident. Perhaps we feel that if we do ask a question, it might be a dumb question and are not going to look as smart and confident as we think. But in actuality, those who ask thoughtful questions appear humble gain respect, engage in dialogue, and help with interpersonal communication. We talked about eight different essential questioning techniques that one should know, how it can help us gain better answers, avoid, getting, avoid communication breakdowns. We talked about some of the questions that we wanted to avoid, like closed questions, which just invited a one-word answer, like, do you drive? Do you like my pen? Now, they can be good for us to help start dialogue, but at some point, you want to move on from the closed questions to other types of questions. You might want to use open questions or a probing question, perhaps funnel questions or a rhetorical question to help gain engagement with your audience. Are you using these types? Perhaps you're using a leading question or a loaded question. All of these different types of questions have a place and a time to use them in your conversation, whether it be at work, whether it be at home. And if we can master the art of questioning, it is going to start to enrich us beyond any other self-development tool out there. Because ultimately, if you can ask the questions that you need to get the answers, isn't that what it's all about, getting answers to questions? We talked about the power of questioning and how much of an executive's workday is spent asking others for information. But sometimes you ask a question of an executive and their response is a bit you know, bland. They're not engaging. They're not asking these types of questions. For some, questioning becomes easier, is easy. It comes naturally. It's something that, that they do. I think the good news is that if we learn the questioning techniques and come up with some questions 
that we ask, we can improve our ability to ask questions. Now, not all questions are created equal. There's lots of benefits to follow-up questions. We need to know when to ask open questions, know when to ask closed questions. But also, it's important to understand the group dynamic, the tone. What is someone saying? Where are they saying it? We then talked about leading questions and how these leading questions can be very useful in a court of law. But the lessons learned, such as suggestive insinuation, too many variables, glossing over details, asserting uninformed quantities, jury manipulation through reverse psychology, are also things that could be impeding our ability to have thoughtful communication with those of us we want to communicate. I think at the end of the day, it comes down to figuring out, is this something that's going to help you in your personal development? And if it is, you're going to want to start to break those old patterns, break those habits, come up with a way to consciously prioritize and commit to your new goals and intentions, and ultimately having someone to coach you through it can help. Well, that's all the show for this week. It's been a pleasure being here with you. We'll see you next time.